So the other day I was hit with some really fucked up news. Uh, Nick Turner died at 82, age 82. <clears throat> Nick Turner was co-founder of Hawkwind, which is to me the most groundbreaking uh, space rock band in history. To me, they kind of codified the subgenre. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, Pink Floyd uh, had the jump on them by a couple of years. But by the time Hawkwind were really revving up, Pink Floyd was kind of already going away from space rock. Sid Barrett was out of the group. <clears throat> they were kind of planing out with Uma Guma, Adam Hart, Mother era. Uh, Nick Turner was a hippie who loved uh, he loved rock, but he loved jazz. He was a saxophone player. He was a very unconventional saxophone player. I can't say he was like squalling like Albert Eiler or Annette Coleman, but his stuff was a bit more tenuous and not quite as wild and free, but it was it was equally kind of fractured and undisciplined, more atmospheric. He would put it through the echoplex and stuff. He also sang. He also wrote lyrics. He was a science fiction buff. Um, he was a guy with a very rich uh, inner world. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Nick Turner in 1994. Uh, <clears throat> he had, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but you know, Hawkwind was named after Nick Turner. Hawkwind was his nickname, which allegedly was uh, referencing to him going, you know, Hawk, kind of like spitting kind of shit, and, um, which was weird. <clears throat> but then it became this kind of regal, spacey, Appalachian, and it was evocative of Michael Moorcock, science fiction writer Michael Moorcock's character, Cor uh, Corum Hawkmoon. And of course, Hawkmoon, not Hawkmoon, Moorcock ended up befriending the band and vice versa. He ended up appearing with them live, um, pinning some lyrics for them, um, <clears throat> doing spoken word parts on a few of their albums, and ultimately they did a concept album in 1984 called The Chronicle of the Black Sword, which was based around Michael Moorcock's signature character, the eternal champion, Elric of Mil Nibine. Hawkwind went all out, you know, they did a tour, they did a, you know, they had acted out those parts from the books of the, the Hawkwind, I mean the Hawkwind, the uh, Elric books. Um, had a guy dressed as Elric with the sword, Stormbringer. And, you know, they did an album based off this called Live Chronicles. They did a video. Quite impressive. Shortly before they did this project, <clears throat> Nick Turner had uh, actually come back to the band for a while. It's interesting to chart this whole thing. So let me start from the beginning. So, <clears throat> as I understand it, I've done a bit of research, but I didn't do any special research to do this because this is kind of how, you know, from the heart. But I'll try to get my facts as straight as possible. So Nick Kerner has had a huge impact on rock music and on psychedelic music, space rock, obviously inestimable influence. And he's had a huge influence on me and my, my music listening tastes and habits. The way I view music, philosophy about music. And like I said, the band had been called Group X. Uh, and around 1969, uh, the leaders of the band, co founders, were Dave Brock, who sang and played lead guitar and rhythm guitar, and Nick Turner, who sang and played uh, saxophone and flute. And they both wrote lyrics and music. So they congealed into this thing called Hawkwind Zoo. It's just kind of a pun on Nick Turner's nickname. Finally, they became just Hawkwind. I'm unclear right now as to when they, the Michael Moorcock connection began. But anyway, they released an album, eponymous album, Hawkwind in 1969. And it was 
a little folky, a little psychedelic. It was pretty cool. Um, it was kind of primitive sounding, low production values. It has stood the test of time. It had some of the songs that Dave Brock had been doing on the busking circuit, where he's basically just him and his acoustic and occasionally electric guitar, just singing, playing, kind of post Bob Dylan ish style. Now, mind you, Dave Brock was already 28 when this album came out. Nick Turner was uh, a year older. So. These guys weren't, they were older than the Rolling Stones, Black Sabbath, a lot of people from this era. We'd spend a lot of the 60s just jamming, you know, doing drugs, ingesting huge amounts of drugs, and ingesting huge amounts of literature and, and film and culture and music. Um, and I forgot the town that they originally came from, I want to say Sheffield, but I know that's not, not correct. Um, so anyway, after their first album, um, their lineup started to kind of get kind of um, irregular. Their lead guitar player, uh, Hugh Lloyd Langton, left the band. He was uh, very interesting on the first album, but didn't hint at his incredible talent he later had. Uh, he later evinced. And... Um, so Nick and Dave did a, a couple more albums that were more and more delving into science fiction. Uh, along the way, they ended up getting a uh, bass player, Ian Kilminster, or Lemmy, Lemmy Kilminster, who had uh, been a roadie for Jimi Hendrix, and he'd done an incredible album uh, with Sam Gopal. Um, I think it's called Elevator, something like that. Just an incredible psychedelic album. Where Lemmy played very heavy bass and, and sang most of the lead parts. Very distinctive voice. Of course, Lemmy is now known, the late Lemmy is now known as, as the <clears throat> founder and architect of a really influential band, Motorhead, that kind of fused his hippie, nomadic, biker kind of persona, lifestyle, uh, with uh, going away from Hawkwind science fiction and more into really kind of hardcore punk kind of territory, faster, louder, more aggressive. And I'd say Motorhead was kind of the bridge uh, between psychedelic and metal and punk and hardcore. And they were hugely influential in early British hardcore bands like Discharge and Exploited. Exploited actually uh, adopted some of their beats they would use and modified them slightly and that became known as discharge beats or D beats which eventually became the norm fast kind of drum beat used in D beat or crust punk which later became to me kind of the the ascendant hardcore punk style it's really the style played today still played today that has the bite and the power and the rawness of early hardcore punk, <clears throat> but it's all, you know, when they exploit and discharge GBH, those bands came out, they weren't necessarily called hardcore, uh, and this was, you know, the hardcore scene in America was still kind of codifying New York and LA, and you had bands like uh, Black Flag and <clears throat> Bad Brains and the Germs, etc. It was really a time of a lot of change. Motorhead just kept kind of straight ahead. The, let me just call their music rock and roll. I mean, yeah, but it was it was very much kind of a metal punk hybrid, and they've kind of become now like enshrined uh, as kind of iconic figures in heavy metal music. Um, so Lemmy uh, really got his kind of first big uh, break visibility wise playing bass and Hawkwind, occasionally singing lead, uh, occasionally writing uh, lyrics and, and writing co writing music. Um, eventually you had a setup where these three cats and this incredible drummer, Simon King, uh, had uh, forged an alliance with some electronics wizards, uh, Del Detmar and Dick Mick. Um, Dick Mick was rumored for a little while to be actually Brian Eno and her pseudonym, but it was not. But Dick Mick was kind of Eno-esque. Um, he was kind of what Eno brought to the first uh, couple of Roxy Music albums, basically just a an atmospheric kind of bubbling 
kind of, you know, electronic sounds kind of bubbling to the surface under the rock music. And of course, you know, Roxy Music also had a guitar saxophone duo. <clears throat> I'm not saying Roxy Music and Hawkwind sounded alike, uh, but they they utilized a lot of the same instrumentation uh, and definitely were both trendsetters. So Hawkwind was a bit more underground. Roxy Music commercially hit pretty, you know, relatively early. Hawkwind <clears throat> never really hit big commercially. They, ne they never really had worldwide. Um, they really didn't have a whole lot of following in America, kind of a cult following. They rarely toured America after early to mid seventies. Um, and that's kind of maintained, kind of been the way of it all the way to the present. Uh, Hawkwind is still going under Dave Brock. Allegedly he's going to retire uh, in the next year or two. You know, he's 80 now, almost 81. Um, Nick Turner uh, really kind of drove the first few albums with Dave Brock. Uh, both of them had very distinctive vocals, distinctive lyrics. A lot of the um, Dave Brock songs kind of passed into the canon of stuff they played live and things they re-recorded and jammed on, because that's kind of how they did a lot of their songs, morphed and mutated over the years. Um, you know, but then you have uh, the songs that Nick Turner sang uh, and or co-wrote in Brainstorm and You Shouldn't Do That and um, Master of the Universe. And um, then there were songs that uh, poet Bob Calvert recited. They were kind of spoken word, segueing into songs, mostly music by Brock. Um, on the tour, they did the Space Ritual Tour. So they did the Space Ritual Tour alive in London and they recorded it, a double live album. And when you listen to the entire live album, and especially if you listen to the extended version with other outtakes that are not on the official album, and also take in the incredible art because it was a multiple gatefold, multi-level gatefold double album. And so you opened up the gatefold and then you could open up the top and the bottom. And you had this complex work of art. <clears throat> Center of the work of art was this character, this nude female kind of high priestess character that was, you know, more or less uh, an iteration of Stacia. Now, Stacia was a gorgeous and extremely well endowed British woman who would dance completely naked uh, at all the Hawkwind shows. She was kind of a de facto member of the group. And that alone as a statement in Britain, just a woman dancing naked, unselfconsciously at a rock show. Um, I don't know, it would still be considered pretty wild in some circles. But, you know, early 70s Britain, no matter how visionary Britain was as far as musicians, culturally they weren't really all that. They were still kind of stuffy and, and vulgar uh, or anti-vulgar. And Hawkwind, they were trip. And literally, I mean, you know, they did a lot of drugs. Um, so they finally had a hit single called Silver Machine, uh, which I kind of forget who wrote the song. I want to say Bob Calvert wrote the lyrics. I could be wrong. And maybe Dave Brock and Lemmy wrote the music. But on the single version, Lemmy is playing lead. His bass is very prominent. And, you know, it's one of those songs that it kind of has this surf rock kind of beat going into it. And it's one of those songs that once you hear it, you'll hear it over and over for all eternity. And it's like, I just took a ride on a silver machine, and I'm still feeling mean. You want to ride sideways through time? Um, I'm saying all this because Nick Turner was a big part of all this, even the songs like that that he didn't write. Um... And I think a lot of this finally culminated in this album called Warrior at the Edge of Time. The Warrior at the Edge of Time was, most of the lyrics were written by My Michael Moorcock. Now this album came out immediately subsequent to the Space Ritual Tour. So they were already working with Bob Calvert. Now they're working with Michael Moorcock, who wrote most of the lyrics and the album and did spoken word parts. So the wizard blew his horn and things like that. And, uh, you know, then there were these incredible songs like Magnu. They were talking about 
characters within Michael Moorcock's uh, own mythology. He was, you know, new wave sci-fi writer, started in the early 60s, and he had a whole kind of, a whole sword and sorcery fantasy kind of universe that was very different uh, than J.R.R. Tolkien or Robert E. Howard. It was very modern, cutting edge, uh, filled with drugs and blood and, and sex, and these kind of interlocking characters that were all kind of reincarnations of this um, totemic uh, being called the Eternal Champion. Coram Hawkmoon was an incarnation, or Dor Dorian, what's his name, Coram Hawkmoon, and uh, I'm sorry, see I'm mixing up the characters. Coram was one character. There's Dorian Hawkmoon, Elric of Milnibane, and then there were like more modern iterations. Uh, I think they were also sort of adjacent to the Eternal Champion in his, you know, that were uh, characters that were either took place in the modern day or in the near future, like Jerry Cornelius. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the other character's name. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, they all kind of existed within the same multiverse. Uh, in the uh, 90s and 2000s, there was even a DC comic uh, licensed by Michael Moorcock. Uh, mainly commandeered by Walt Simonson, uh, famous for a great run on Thor uh, and uh, Manhunter and some other incredible work. He did the graphic novel adaptation of the film Alien. Um, and this comic was called Michael Warcock's Multiverse. I, I have a bunch of issues which I'm selling. I've sold a couple. Um, <clears throat> but it kind of explored all these different phases. And by this time, Moorcock within his own work was tying everything together into one kind of continuity uh, with different levels, and he called it the multiverse. And, uh, I think he was using this term a bit before Marvel and DC Comics were using it commonly. No one really has a copyright on the term multiverse, thankfully. Um, so, Morning Edge of Time uh, really has some Amazing Day Brock tunes, like Assault and Battery slash Golden Void, uh, opens with a great Lemmy bass line. To me, is really one of the most transcendent Hawkwind songs. Very trancy, very beautifully melodic. And, and Nick Turner does some amazing work on it. Um, but after this album, that was kind of just about it. Uh, Nick Turner did one more album with Hawkwind called Psychedelic Warlords. Uh, which also has some incredible Dave Rocks, all they disappear in smoke, which is just amazing. And but it has quite a few Nick Turner songs like D Rider, and he kind of that was one of his many nicknames, the D Rider. And, and you know, like Dave Brock was like Captain Brock and um, Doctor Technical, and he had a zillion these pseudonyms. They they always played with names and identities and mythologies and kind of created this whole kind of thing like the spaceship Hawkwind and a lot like what George Clinton did with Parliament Funkadelic only that stuff was like Afrofuturism meets like deep heavy funk and uh, with kind of some socio-political shit and a lot of you know sex and, and, and raunchiness whereas Hawkwind was very highly conceptual highly psychedelic uh, their music was for the most part kind of upbeat and and it became increasingly heavy guitar-wise, and when Dave Brock took over all the guitars, uh, it became more so. And when Lemmy was fired from the group and Nick Turner uh, left, Dave Brock kind of took over the band, was writing all the music, playing all the guitars, and, and he turned the lead vocals over to Bob Calvert, who joined as a singer in addition to kind of the Hoey Laureate of Hawkwind. Nick Turner formed a punk band called Inner City Unit. He started wearing a lot of makeup on stage. He'd always been highly theatrical. His his image shifted though from from uh, aging hippie to to you know uh, crazy punk, and he maintained a lot of the imagery through a lot of his solo career uh, from the late seventies at least through the early two thousands. Uh, he used to wear big goggles, he would have a mohawk that was usually dyed red or pink, and he'd have like a white makeup and a swath of black across his eyes. He would wear this kind of weird suit, which was kind of like a spaceman suit, it was tight, he was very slim, he was a very energetic performer. Uh, and 
After any inner city unit folded, he returned to Hawkwind, and they played a few inner city unit songs live, like Watching the Grass Grow, which is this incredible, heavy, all out of salt punk song. And uh, Turner was pretty irrepressible. Uh, unfortunately, even though at this point he kind of became the front man for Hawkwind again, it only lasted a couple of years. Hawkwind had evolved into this kind of new wave slash heavy metal sound uh, when they signed to, um, oh God, I can't remember, I want to say RCA, but that might not be it. They did three incredible albums, like Sonic Attack and Church of Hawkwind. Um, damn, what was that other album? They did a compilation of the tracks from the three albums under the name Angels of Death. That was one of the first Hawkwind albums I bought. Um, by this time, Hugh Lloyd Langton, their original lead guitarist, was back in the band. He was very doing very transcendental, super melodic, wailing, passionate leads, kind of like somewhere between Dave Gilmore. David Gilmore, Pink Floyd, and Steve Rothery of Hawk of Marillion. And of course, during that period of my life, I, when I got into Hawkman, I loved all those guys. I loved Brian May, people who are just really just soaring emotive on the guitar and, and very fluid. And Hugh Langton was one of the greatest. Now, he had also been in a couple of other super groups of sorts between his stints with Hawkman. I want to say he was in Widowmaker, but I, I'm probably wrong about that. But it's one that you guys would probably recognize, but he wasn't in, in in these groups for very long. So he came back to Hawkwind and he he started singing for Hawkwind, writing music, and doing this amazing lead. So Brock, kind of for a very brief time, all of these volatile personalities, Brock, Lloyd Langton, Nick Turner, and kind of a revolving rhythm section, keyboard section. Uh, well, Harvey, Harvey Bainbridge was their bass player, and then he became their keyboardist, and he was in there for many years. So, like, the four, these four guys kind of created this incredible sound. Uh, they did um, they did a live video called Night of the Hawks. They had a brief reunion with Lemmy for a couple of tracks, mainly the song Night of the Hawks. Um, you know, and, and this is, they did uh, the Stonehenge ritual, and, you know, they played live at Stonehenge, and this Nick Turner was in his full regalia that I described earlier. Uh, it was an exciting time, but then the, the clash of the egos kind of happened again. After that, Nick Turner was permanently out of Hawkwind. They brought kind of then did a Tony Iommi like he did with Black Sabbath in the mid '80s, which basically bought up and, and bought and or purloined all rights to the name Hawkwind and all the iconography. And to this day, Dave Brock has been the only consistent member throughout the whole. You know, it's really his band. Uh, once you got these really key people like, uh, you know, key people like Lemmy and Lloyd Langton and Bob Calvert out of the picture, and of course the co-founder and namer of the band, turner of the band, and really who was left, it was just pretty much a Dave Brock thing. And of course, luckily Dave Brock is, is almost endlessly inventive and creative and, and, and writes really incredible stuff to this day. Uh, Hawkwind... Any new Hawkwind album has something interesting, inventive, and engaging in it. Um, he's had a partnership with a drummer called Richard Chadwick now for about 30, over 30 years, almost 35 years. And that's really been his longest uh, sustained. Um, he had Alan Davey on bass uh, on and off from the early 80s to the mid 2000s. But really, other than Chadwick, since the 2000s, there's been a revolving door. He's had past members come in and out and new members. He's had different front men, and he's been the front man. Um, there was a period in the 90s before, right before Hugh Lloyd Langton, uh, right after Hugh Lloyd Langton left, where he got Simon House back on violin, who had played on Morgan the Edge of Time, and had been uh, part of David Bowie's band on the Low Tour. And uh, he had Simon House, but he had a female uh, lead singer and front woman, Bridget Wishart, and they did a Great album, Space Bandits, and an incredible video. It was just amazing. Brock has always experimented. You know, a lot of the later stuff becomes almost totally electronic and trancey, but then he'll get it back in with rock riffs and heavy guitars. Nick Turner's a little harder to chart, but essentially in the early 90s, he decided that, you know, he co-founded Hawkwind, so he's going to do his iteration of Hawkwind. So 
he mounted a tour. Uh, he got uh, rhythm guitarist, bassist, drummer, keyboardist. Uh, they were a band called Pressure Head. They had been signed to Cleopatra Records, which Turner had also. And you know, Cleopatra Records was kind of a goth-oriented label, but they they signed a lot of bands and reissued a lot, a lot of classic stuff like Christian Death and Chrome. Their mixing wasn't always the best, I have to say. The sounds the sound on their CDs was not always up to the, the sounds on the original records. Um, they were remastering. But they did do some albums with Nick Turner, and during this period, like roughly 1993 to 1995, six, uh, Nick Turner went out on a few tours, uh, and originally he called it uh, Nick Turner's Hawkwind. Sometimes billed as Nick Turner's Hawkwind, featuring Helios Creed. So he had Pressurehead as his band, a, a, a space rock group that was on Cleopatra. Uh, he had Del Detmar back on synthesizer and weird noises from the old Hawkwind. And he had Helios Creed, the guitarist uh, from Chrome, uh, on guitar. And so he had an amazing lineup. And briefly, very briefly, he had Genesis P. Orig from Psychic TV, Throbbing Gristle, also in the group. For Genesis was going through a really troubled period right here. Of, of his marriage was falling apart. He became homeless. You know, he went from America to Britain, back and forth. Um... So he was originally announced for the tour as a member of this, this configuration. He had been a huge Hawkwind fan. A lot of musicians who played music that uh, much more contemporary and seemingly antithetical to a, an old hippie psychedelic band like Hawkwind, as they were kind of mischaracterized, loved Hawkwind. John and John Lydon, Johnny Rotten, Hawkwind was one of his very favorite groups, big influence. Um, Hawkwind kind of had the same stature as like. Peter Hamill and Van der Graaff Generator, a group that never really hit huge internationally, but had this inestimable effect on all kinds of musicians, lyricists, and singers. Um, so in the 90s, Nick Turner embarked on the tour and they came to Charlotte, uh, where I live, and they went to this small club, the Milestone Club, which has been around since the 70s and has had some pretty historic uh, punk and alternative rock shows there um so this by this time he came here genesis pure just no longer part of this configuration um also dave brock was already moving to sue him to not to drop the hawk wind appellation so when i went to see them uh i went with my then roommate jeremy um i went with my then girlfriend but i went with my soon to be then girlfriend um and uh, a buddy of ours named Shannon, and we met up with uh, Michael Lillard and several other musicians. A lot of people were there, lead singer of, of uh, Anti-Scene, Jeff Clayton, uh, Michael Jones, an old friend of mine from the band Boyle. Uh, I didn't know him then, but he was there. Uh, almost everybody that I knew or that was into anything was at that Hawkwind show in January. It was like a life-changing show. And Nick Turner led this group singing and dancing and saxophone playing and you know poetry recitation and basically he did all the classic Hawkwind stuff except the stuff solely written by Dave Brock so he was doing his own material such as Brainstorm I uh, shouldn't do that and Master of the Universe um, you know then he was doing Bob Calvert stuff from Space Ritual like uh, the uh, Final Second of Forever, is that what it's called? Uh, and, um, hmm, I'm trying to think. A lot of, so a few songs that uh, Orgone Accumulator, uh, which he sang on Space Ritual, uh, you know, based around the idea of Wilhelm Reich's Orgone Accumulator, long story. Um, just a lot of incredible songs, but he didn't do very very day brock specific songs like lord of light or down through the night or these just which were incredible songs in our space ritual um he did motorhead up no he didn't do motorhead he did silver machine and he did some inner city unit songs which had also been played with hawkwind such as watching the grass grow he did ghost dance which also came out that 83 84 period when he was back with hawkwind he opened with ghost dance which is a really haunting weird chanting song um 
it really was an amazing show. I never thought I'd hear these songs played in a little club in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it was a turning point for me in my life at the time. And unfortunately, I started to go down kind of a darker path. It's not because of Hawkwind or Nick Turner. But it was just that show was kind of a line of demarcation for me. And, and I was at a crossroads, and I, I had some decisions to make, and I, I made the wrong one. I took, I took a fork in the road that I thought was ascendant, you know, glorious and resplendent, but became hopeless and dark, and really took a severe, severe health injury uh, a year and a half later, uh, and then a total immersion in a lot of things that I had been curious about but had not resonated with me, like jazz, heavy, heavy immersion in jazz, and, and also a reawakened interest in uh, writers like William S. Burroughs, J.G. Ballard. And um, I had kind of a creative renaissance, and I got back to my long term story, Flicker Street, and was incredibly productive, and, and film, of course, was all consuming to me. Um, Nick Turner played in 95 here again, a different club. At this point, my health problems were horrible. I really could not, literally could not stand up at a show or comfortably sit down for an hour. Um, so we decided not to go. Uh, and that's unfortunate. I know people went to both shows. Um, that was a bigger club. It probably had a slightly different atmosphere. I can't remember who all was playing with him at that time. Um, I want to say maybe Helios Creed and Pressurehead members still, but I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. I think Simon House may have been playing with him. Um, so around this time, Cleopatra put out a kind of a lackluster compilation. It was very poorly produced. Basically, like Prophets of Time or something. But I bought it and just immediately hated it and sold it. it just, the sound was really terrible. Had some interesting songs like Bones of Elvis. And um, one thing I got out of going to the show in 94 that was really life changing was um, I got to meet Nick Turner. And first, I bought a t shirt and I bought a uh, press book from Z Silver. Now, Z Silver at the time was the keyboardist for Helios Creed. Now, I had seen Helios Creed and that band play Milestone uh, about a year earlier. And Z and Helios were still a couple. So Z was doing the, the tour with them with Hawk, that version of Hawkwind, but she wasn't playing. She was kind of doing all the merchandising, interacting with fans. And she said, hey, you can, you can meet Helios because he's got a jacket just like the one you're working wearing. And I was wearing a German border guard jacket. It was not a Nazi jacket, but I think it would remind, mind, especially now, it would probably remind people. It was a very cool trench coat gray that I got from Army Navy store. She's like, he has one just like it. And it's weird because you're short and he's tall and your guys coats both fall the exact same place on your legs. I don't know. <laughs> she was a trip. So she said, go talk to him. And I was like, seriously? So I went to talk to him. He's getting his beer off stage. And I was with my then roommate, Jeremy. And, and lurking about were my friend, Michael Lillard. And whose photos from that show, by the way, I posted on my community page here on YouTube. Check those out. There's two photos. Uh, and then my friend Shannon and the two women I went with. But, uh, you know, uh, me and Jeremy and Michael uh, got all, all of whom, all of us had been former members of the band Chiaroscura that had played Milestone Club before. And um, we uh, talked to Del Detmar, the keyboardist. And Jeremy kind of put his foot in his mouth, but, you know, that happens sometimes with him. Uh, and then Del Detmar, uh, and he, Helios tripped out on us. Helios was super nice to me. And he said, go backstage, talk to Nick, man. I was like, oh, my God. And um, he just seemed kind of high. Uh, but he was an incredible guy. I, I, I remained in contact with Helios for a number of years after that. I've lost touch with him now, but in the MySpace years, uh, 2000s. Well, after the show, we 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 got back in touch and talked a bit. Um, and uh, I got this press book, and it, it had you know pictures of the makeup and the costumes, and it basically like a it looked like a 
photocopied zine almost. It was like typed up real primitively and it was stapled together with this kind of fluorescent green cover and then all the pages inside were black and white with photos. And it basically had like interviews with Nick and Nick talked about groups he liked and what he's listening to nowadays. And he mentioned that he really liked, you know, African-American music. He loved jazz. He loved Coltrane. And, and he was listening to Public Enemy and hip hop a lot recently. And, you know, by this time he was in his mid fifties, you know, and, um, it was a really incredible book and Hilo signed it. And then, uh, Nick Turner signed it. We met him backstage. He had all his makeup off. He looked like kind of an industrial band gearhead. He was wearing like a black t-shirt, black jeans, tight black jeans and black big industrial boots. And he had his mohawk slicked back, uh, and he just, he looked kind of grizzled, but he looked really cool. And he he was smoking some weed and he was talking to us. And unfortunately, my friend kind of also said some semi-embarrassing things. We didn't really know they were embarrassing. We asked about Genesis P. Orridge and he was like, Genesis who? And I was like, whoa. So my friend was like, I thought he was he was coming. And Nick's like, no, that, that mate blew us off back in San Francisco or something. So that explain that. Um, and we just talked a little. We talked about Bob Calvert. And he told us a story about how he died. And I didn't really know what to say. I was not very confident talking to like famous people or accomplished people or artists that I admired back then. Um, I'm a little more comfortable with it now. But so me and Jeremy are both a bit awkward. But it was a great experience. It, it just being in his presence and. I don't know, such an intimate uh, setting. He was just a very real, authentic person. So like I said, I miss, mix, I miss their next show here, and I eventually kind of lost track of what he was doing for our time. Whereas I did tend to keep up with the Hawkwind proper with Dave Rock. After a while, I lost track of all of this stuff. So within the last several years, since I've moved into the house in 2015, and I've been kind of ravenously getting back into music, very highly passionate level and uh, acquiring a lot of stuff that I've never had before and hearing a lot of stuff I've never heard before. This is still going on a daily quest. I finally heard the entire Hawkwind catalog and I really enjoyed the later records. I finally heard the later Nick Turner records and he did several tours at Space Ritual after, you know, Brock had told him to cease and desist with the Hawkwind. Uh, Nick Turner's Space Ritual, there's some live stuff, there's some studio albums. Uh, the last couple of studio albums are, are incredible. The last one I think he did, well, in 2019, I think it's the very last one, was called The Final Frontier. Um, it's amazing. It's still up to date. I saw live performances of him in the 2010s. Now, mind you, at this point, he's getting way up into his 70s. Uh, he'd grown his hair back out. He wasn't wearing the makeup or all the theatrical stuff anymore. His sax playing was incredible. He had a lot of great breath for his age. I mean, he really actually, his playing was a lot more technical than it had been previously. It was a lot, a lot more like hardcore jazz during his solos. Still doing really spacey, far out, wild, psychedelic music. He was a, tr a true visionary. And, uh, you know, like I said, I just recently listened to those records for the first time and acquired a couple and I was really digging on him, and then I hear he passed. Um, I was a little shocked. He seemed like the kind of guy that just wouldn't give in to, to anything, including death. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to talk about him for a little bit, recount my meeting with him and my feelings about him and his music. I'm not an expert on Nick Turner. I, I, I probably know far more about Dave Brock, and I'm not any kind of real expert on him, but I have been passionately engaged with Hawkwind's music since 1986 and um so more than half of my life uh, I've been I've been very uh Hawkwind and Motorhead and, and their various ancillary offshoots have really meant a lot to me uh Hawkwind really kind of was one of a few bands that really changed the way I listened to and regarded rock music and lyrics and um possibilities of it and it was before I got into Kind of spacey jazz like Sun Ra, but I wouldn't have gotten into Sun Ra if I hadn't moved for Hawkwind. And you know, I got interested in Hawkwind because I had read Michael Moorcock, and also I was into metal, and I, I'd been curious about Motorhead. Um, 
but I finally listened to the two bands around the same time, within a couple of months of each other. And they were both really life-changing experiences. Motorhead kind of took me to the next level, of really heavy, aggressive music. Um, and then, you know, Hawkwind really took me to that next level of music that the sounds and the, the words evoked, you know, the kind of uh, genre things I was passionate about, like science fiction, all kinds of different science fiction and fantasy ideas and, and stuff. So anyway, rest in peace, Nick Turner, you changed the world and uh, we are forever grateful. So I hope you are finally at one with the cosmos, grooving out there eternally. And thank